You know what? I've been around for a while. I've traveled the world, met some interesting people, done some crazy things. So you might just think there's not much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Like the heart transplant patient who undergoes an uncanny transformation, assuming the personality of his donor, scientists ask, could the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde be real? A weird phenomenon is appearing in lakes and rivers, perfect circles of ice, some so big they're visible from space. What are they? And a DNA test that suggests the impossible, a mother somehow genetically unrelated to her own children. Could the test be wrong? Or is the truth beyond reason? Could it be possible for a human being to have more than one set of DNA? Yep. It's a weird world. And I love it. You don't need me to tell you that modern medicine is utterly remarkable. The kind of procedures that only exist in the realm of science fiction 50 years ago are now commonplace. Take heart failure. Still the world's biggest killer, but these days, if you're lucky, doctors can transplant a healthy heart into your chest. Within weeks, you can be up and running with a whole new lease on life, thanks to the kindness of some recently departed donor. Incredible. but. As this next weird tale will reveal, transplant patients may be getting more than they bargained for. Not simply someone else's heart, but their personality, too. I had worked very hard, and I had sold my soul for the greenback. I was a fat, out-of-shape businessman, not taking care of myself. My exercise regime was going to two banks each day to deposit and uh, walking to my office, which was across the driveway from the home we had built. Bill Wall was obsessed with making money. But when he suffered a massive heart attack in 1999, his life changed forever. They told me a number of times I was their worst cardiac case ever. Bill needed a new heart. And on February 22, 2000, a suitable organ became available. The donor was a Hollywood stuntman named Brady Michaels. A fit, focused, passionate man who tragically died doing the job he loved. Brady's death would ultimately save Bill Wall's life. I remember waking up that afternoon very sore, but I had a new heart and... Uh, I was smiling. I was grinning from ear to ear because I was so thankful because living in the hospital, you get to appreciate. And if you're smart, you learn love, patience, tolerance, and understanding because there's so many angry people in the world. But after his operation, Bill says he started acting in strange new ways. Well, the first thing that really shocked me was that day driving to work. I usually listen to classic hard rock, Led Zeppelin, things like that. Don't ask me why, but that morning I flipped it to like a jazz station. And I'm driving to work and I hear this song. And it was uh, Sade, The Kiss of Life. And I started crying and it was like butter going through a knife. And I usually don't cry. It takes a lot to make me cry. And uh, here I was like freaking out. Bill learned later that his heart's donor, Brady Michaels, was also a jazz aficionado. According to Bill, the transplant didn't just change his musical tastes, it also changed his vocabulary. And it's really funny, I can tell you as a cutthroat businessman, the, the surfer lingo and dude did not fit into my character. It, it just, uh, you know, big CEOs or 
uh, working with people like a Paul Allen or a Jerry Reinsdorf, uh, they didn't know from dude. They didn't want to hear that. He also found he was copying Michael's taste for healthy food. He was a health nut. Um, he was very big on salads. In the old days, if there weren't french fries, if there wasn't a, a steak or a lobster tail or something fried, it wasn't going to happen. Now, once in a while, as a treat, I'll have something like that. But I actually love salads. And uh, one other little thing, when I work out, I found, and when I drive now, I'm drumming and I'm beating. And I never had a beat before. And uh, now I've gotten pretty good with it. Especially when I'm in the gym working out, I, I play my music and uh, I, I rock in the gym. I'm totally oblivious. Most astonishingly, Bill's new heart transformed him from an overweight couch potato into a physical fitness freak, just like Brady Michaels. Bill believes that in taking Brady Michaels' heart, he has taken some of Michaels' personality. I'm living with a part of him that he's blessed me. And with that blessing has come some ideas and thoughts and characteristics that have kind of melded and, and become a part of my everyday life. Wow, this is all very weird. I told you it was weird. A guy gets a heart transplant and he believes he got a bonus. He got the donors personality too and it's more than the heart think about it there are thousands of other transplants done each year lungs kidneys livers if this guy is right are those people getting their donors personalities as well is this even possible bill wall's remarkable story suggests something that common sense says cannot be could our organs really store the essence of our being can one person's body assimilate the personality of someone long since dead? Psychology professor Dr. Gary Schwartz thinks so. If all tissues could store information and energy, then if a tissue was removed from one person and was surgically placed in another, there would be a transplant not only of the matter, but of the memory as well. Bill's case is not all that unusual when compared to other extraordinary cases. Schwartz has researched the transfer of memory for 30 years and has tracked down some 70 cases of similar donor stories. I have seen too many cases of uncanny and accurate uh, parallels for me to question whether there's a phenomenon here. In 1988, Claire Sylvia received the heart and lungs of a young man who died in a motorcycle accident. After the operation, she develops a new taste for beer, green peppers, and chicken nuggets, things her former self would never have eaten. The donor's parents tell her that their son, Tim, loved nothing more than beer and green peppers, and chillingly, on the night Tim died, he was riding his motorcycle with a box of chicken nuggets in his pocket. There are examples from Bill's case which indicate the specificity above and beyond simple changes in diet or exercise, which a lot of people might do because they had a heart transplant. Can't these personality changes be explained as a reaction to a brush with death? Or even as side effects of the powerful anti-rejection drugs used after transplant surgery? The first thing we want to entertain are conventional explanations like side effects of the drugs, stress of the surgery, or just uh, changes in, in, in philosophy of life. The uh, side effects from uh, major organ transplant are mostly related to the immunosuppression that's required because the, the uh, recipient immune system wants to fight against the, uh, the, the new organ. And so uh, they're given drugs and medication to tame down their immune system. And most of the side effects and toxicity come from these immunosuppressant drugs that, that reduce the, uh, the response of the body to the new organ. A side effect of a steroid might change people's anxiety level or it might change a, maybe a certain food preference, but it's going to be random in relationship to the uh, preferences and personality of the donor. In order for that change to match the donor, there has to be some coupling, and that coupling is not going to come from the drug. Now, the drugs may facilitate sometimes, those connections, but they're not causing the match. The matches can only be explained by some sort of memory or you know, informational connection.
connection. I don't think the anti-rejection drugs, as toxic as they may be, could explain the specific information that gets transferred. That would have to be pure luck or some actual mechanism of transference from the, from the donor to the recipient. So it appears to be too much of a coincidence to be the drugs. Dr. Stuart Hamarov has a radical theory that suggests something almost beyond belief. Can the human heart actually store our memories? It's not only the brain that can store memory. We have muscle memory. We learn to play tennis, and, and there's uh, information stored in the, in the nerves that control the muscles. And the heart has a lot of neurons. Outside of the brain, it's one of the largest collections of neurons in the body. The, the nodes that control the, the, uh, the beating of the heart and the conduction and the synchrony of the muscles so the heart beats together synchronously uh, are fairly a substantial complex of neurons. Ganglia, AV nodes that form a little a network of neurons inside the heart. Neurons are specialized cells that transmit information via electrical impulses and chemical signals throughout the body's nervous system. The information they carry allows us to move, think, learn, and feel. Most neuroscientists believe that long-term memories are stored exclusively by neurons in the brain. Dr. Hamarov has a more radical theory. He believes memories can also be stored by neurons in other parts of the body within a cellular structure called a microtubule. Microtubules seem to be the most likely uh, site for memory to be housed because we know that in Alzheimer's disease where you lose memory, it's the microtubules in the brain neurons that fall apart. So there's a number of, of avenues of evidence that lead to the, to the fact that the microtubules are, are housing and storing memory. But it would be focused and more prevalent in parts of the body that have the most neurons, the most microtubules, namely the brain and the big nervous ganglia like the heart. If Dr. Hameroff is right, memories can be stored by microtubules in the brain, the heart, and the spinal cord, or anywhere else there are neurons. This could explain why, when Bill Wall got a heart transplant, he got a memory transplant, too. Dr. Hameroff came to his theory of memory initially by studying neurons and anesthesia, and then extending that to other organs, particularly the heart. So he's looking at a very special case of how a particular component of a cell can have memory. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with it. Throughout human history, poets and philosophers have invested the heart with powers and meaning beyond that of a simple organ. In Papua New Guinea, victorious warrior tribes would consume the hearts of the vanquished to absorb their qualities. In the arts, the heart has always been seen as the source of all love and passion. Who could refrain that had a heart to love, and in that heart courage to make love known? That's Shakespeare. The heart is central to our culture, and it is our own center. From the heart, everything flows. Now, some scientists believe the heart literally has a mind of its own. But, but could memory and intelligence be found in more than our hearts and heads? Could it be coursing through our whole bodies? Dr. Schwartz's theory takes things a step further. He thinks memory can be stored in all cells throughout the body, not just the neurons, thanks to something called feedback. Feedback is the essence of learning and memory. Now, that same feedback process operates at any level. It's what operates within the neurons that allow the neurons to learn between them. But that same feedback that allows the neuron cells to learn is feedback that can operate within the interconnected network of cells in the heart or the lungs or any other organ. That's why feedback memory is, if you would, a universal memory model, which then can, in unique ways, be applied to any system at any level. Feedback occurs when a past event influences the response to the same event in the present or future. According to Schwartz, this loop allows individual cells to have a sort of memory. That's another thing about these feedback loops, is a recurring process. Each time you repeat the process over and over again, it makes the memory stronger. Could our individual cells have a form of memory? Schwartz believes they do. And what's more, he thinks he can prove it. We typically think of muscle memory as being mostly the brain.
but it turns out the muscles have the potential to learn as well because all muscles have feedback, ergo feedback memory and muscle memory in the muscles themselves. Schwartz can show this principle in action. A person is able to train his muscles to shoot basketball hoops using feedback so that he continues to hit the basket even when blindfolded. According to Schwartz, it is not just groups of tissue that can have memories. He thinks it is possible that every single cell in the body can store information. Since feedback loops are operating at every level in the body at every level, there's going to be theoretically memory and to various degrees learning at every level in the body. And so this is not a theory about brain learning or heart learning. It's really even not a theory about cellular learning per se. It's a theory about feedback learning and to the cell extent that cells have feedback loops, then they will learn as well. Although unproven, this theory could help explain the cases of transplant recipients who report receiving the donor's memories, tastes, and behavior along with their new organ. Interesting, but unfortunately all theoretical. Maybe uh, to find the answer to this mystery, we should take a look at a different organ, the human brain. Maybe, just maybe, now that Bill has his new heart and his health, it's gone to his head. Could getting a new lease on life convince you that you are a whole new person? Bill doesn't think it's all that simple. Certainly just getting a transplant and a second chance at life changed me in a major way, but I also totally believe that certain characteristics of my donor have become a basic part of my life, and I feel that this is the cellular memory that's changed my life and I honestly feel made me a better person, a happier person, and I actually love now caring and helping and wanting to make a difference. Most neuroscientists remain skeptical that cellular memory exists at all. Nevertheless, Bill Wall believes memories, just like organs, can be transplanted. One thing is true. Bill's experiences have definitely been weird or what? here but this got me thinking about pi no not 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 this uh, pi the number pi you need the number pi to explain the simple circle and just like the simple round delicious pi when you dig deeper it gets more complicated pi is a constant the ratio of any circles circumference to its diameter but that ratio can be calculated forever without coming to a final decimal circles they start off looking so simple, but when you get down to it, they're really complicated. On December 13, 2007, amateur photographer Brooke Taylor was walking through Rattray Marsh Conservation Area, southern Ontario. Well, I love to do nature photography, landscapes primarily, creeks and waterfalls and anything that's sort of remote and off the beaten path. When he got to Sheridan Creek, Brooke saw something Bizarre, majestic, and totally unexplained. Well, I was coming down here to see what the creek looked like, and as I was coming around the boardwalk over there, I happened to see it. It was about six feet, maybe a little bit more in diameter, and it was turning. Brooke had stumbled upon a strange, beautiful, and mysterious phenomenon. And I was really amazed it was so cool a perfectly round circle inscribed in the ice and so i set up my camera and started shooting brooke posted the photo on the internet and after 150,000 hits he quickly learned that ice circles were a global mystery found across the u.s canada europe russia but what or who was creating them to taylor the similarity to a famous English hoax seemed obvious. Well, I entitled my photograph Creek Circle, take off on Crop Circle, because uh, the, uh, the crop circles are obviously a little bit mysterious. 
perfectly round circles forming naturally in the eyes. Come on. It's too good to be true, right? Too perfect, too weird. Surely someone is messing with us, creating ice circles like they would create crop circles. For over two decades, strange geometrical designs known as crop circles appeared in British farmland. In 1991, two men admitted they were behind the hoax. They created these amazing patterns with little more than a length of rope and a plank of wood. So could the ice circles be the handiwork of human hoaxers, just like many crop circles turned out to be? It's impossible for somebody to, mix, to, to generate these circles. Uh, the ice is very, very thin, very delicate, very, very fragile. And you try and put any sort of thing to cut the ice, you're going to leave evidence of it. Or you're going to have to somehow be standing in the ice or standing in the water to be able to, to hold whatever tool that you have to cut the circle. So uh, I went, it's, not, it's Mother Nature doing her finest. Len Zabolanski is an engineer at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory in New Hampshire. Their research helps the U.S. military operate in cold climates. Ice is nice. This is what we do day in and day out. Uh, we have three facilities here that we replicate the different processes, the ice processes in different phases. Uh, we're in the test basin where we do flat ice, sheet ice. We have another facility where we bring a river system inside, and then we have a large general research area. Len sees a fundamental problem facing people wanting to hoax an ice circle because ice floats on top of the flowing river, there's no support below. The ice doesn't have, very, it doesn't have any strength whatsoever. It's a very delicate process, and it's the water that's sort of holding it together, and there's basically no strength in this. Um, for any, anybody to try and go out and do that, the ice has no strength, and so he has to basically stand in midair to be able to do this, and that's physically impossible. Zablinski believes these perfect ice circles are formed by a unique combination of natural processes. And for the first time, using a unique experiment, he intends to prove it. The way the ice circle is formed is basically in a back eddy. The ice will follow the water. And if the water goes in a circle, so will the ice. Back eddies can be found on bends and rivers where a constriction forces some of the water to flow back on itself, creating a rotating pool. So the theory goes that in the winter, when ice flows into an eddy, it too becomes part of the rotation and begins to grow and grow outward until it grinds against the surrounding static ice like a grist mill, creating the perfect, beautiful ice circle. And what happens in, in, in the winter environment, ice that's coming down in, into, this, into this backwater area actually goes around as well. And as the ice is contributing into this background, it continues to grow in a larger and larger circle. If you look at an ice circles that we've, that we've had pictures of, it looks like a vinyl record is because everything is all very circular with different little ridges around. So what's happening is, is the ice is coming down, bangs into the circle, and it just sort of squashes in and you get a little ridge. And that ridge just keeps building up in time and getting larger and larger and larger and larger in diameter. Like a grist mill, the rotating ice circles grind against the surrounding ice, creating a perfectly round circle and its mirror image. The two pieces will sort of nest together with a little bit of open water between them. And there's a very narrow gap, but you can actually see the milling process actually taking place. Len believes this is exactly what happened to create the ice circle in Brooke Taylor's photo. You can actually still see rings. This is more, this is the kind of ice circle that we're, we're going to duplicate today. What are these mysterious circles of ice? Are they a natural process of nature? Can they be recreated in a lab? Or does the answer to this bizarre mystery lie beyond our planet? At the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory in New Hampshire, engineer Len Zablanski intends to find out with an experiment that has never been attempted before, recreating the conditions that he believes will lead to the creation of an ice circle. What we've created here is the river process that would, be, that would contribute to the formation of an ice circle. In a temperature-controlled laboratory, Len has recreated the prevailing physical and environmental conditions that existed when Brooke Tyler photographed the ice circle. The water is coming from our upstream reach of the river. It's coming down 
passing, but we have more water coming into this section of the river than we can actually allow to leave to sort of create a backwater eddy. What happens is the water coming into our eddy reach, our hydraulic section, is, is less than the water that we're allowing to release from our, our, from our control section. So we're continually recirculating. That's the recirculating section. And so a little bit of the water will come out, but the ice will actually stay in and continually recirculate. The back eddy is a rotating pool of water Lynn believes is needed to trap and grow ice into a circle. We're generating small snow crystals that are settling on the water surface, and that's what we're using to initiate ice. And as the ice forms and creates and circulates around, we're controlling the, 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 the amount of ice that we're generating so we're not plugging up the system. The snow acts like a seed and helps ice crystals to form in the flowing water. And one submersible pump, and as the water comes around, it just shoots it forward along with the ice down into our eddy section. The experiment begins. Will Lens River form an elusive ice circle? See, there's a piece of ice that just started spinning around in our circle. And it will continue to build. And as it continues to rotate, ice that's coming from upstream may accumulate on the edge and that's why you're going to start seeing these ridges. At first, the ice in the back eddy grows as predicted. But it isn't forming as a uniform disk. It's ice, but nowhere near the perfect ice circles he is trying to recreate. We just jammed it. Joe Dislodges is a fluvial geomorphologist, or river expert. He believes he has a better theory to explain this weird quirk of nature. Let's not assume the most wild to start with and let's start uh, thinking about the, the, the true explanations that really help understand these and that is the science. But can science explain the three mile wide ice circle in Russia's Lake Baikal? Features from space look fantastic but when you're actually on the ground you get a better sense of what's likely to be controlling them and probably a different perception entirely about what the composition of them are and what they're made of. So uh, the best science relates to uh, good field evidence, uh, good field investigations, and a lot of the speculation, if you like, or the guesswork that comes from standing afar is a, a good first uh, approximation, but uh, good science really requires you to be out in the field. Joe has spent years studying how rivers behave in cold regions like Canada and Scandinavia. Well, uh, cold climates are fantastic in terms of water and the way water freezes. Uh, you can see a whole range of shapes, but one of the most common one is circular. And they come in a whole variety of sizes. They form at different types and times of the year uh, during the cold season. And uh, it's just a tremendous way in, of, of understanding how uh, rivers interact with, with freezing or cold environments. Joe believes there's another natural process that forms frozen circles on a river. It's called frazzle ice. Frazzle ice forms in rivers when the water cools to a point where you begin forming these ice crystals, or we call them ice nuclei. The process is called supercooling, when water is just slightly below the freezing temperature and these nuclei begin to form. As the tiny ice crystals start to collide, they grow into larger clumps of frazzle ice. Ice is lighter than water, so as the clumps grow, the more buoyant they become. And as they float to the surface, they tend to form these nice circular ice pans. So they actually look like a rather weird phenomenon on the, on the river surface. It's a promising theory, but Joe's ice pans don't look like the spinning perfect ice circles Brooke Taylor photographed in Ontario. Back at the U.S. Army Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, Len Zablansky is still having difficulty creating an ice circle in the lab. It's possible the rate of freezing is too slow, meaning new ice isn't filling in the gaps to make a circular shape. So that just shows you how delicate this process is when Mother Nature is generating these ice circles. Len decides to drop the ambient temperature. We've just dropped the temperature two degrees and we're generating more ice and it's freezing faster. The experiment begins again. This time, the colder temperature is helping build the ice as quickly as it is melted or eroded away. 
You can see that some of the ice is starting to freeze into a circle. As Len predicted, the ice is growing thanks to new ice crystals joining from upstream and sheet ice growing out from the circle itself. If we let this run for another 6-12 hours, that ice will become very, very strong. Allowing his man-made river to flow for hours, Len hopes his experiment will produce a genuine ice circle. The results are remarkable. This is the first time we've created an ice circle of this quality in the lab. Sometimes we've been able to kick out, sometimes we almost had it, but this is the first one that's actually starting to become circular. This is because it's starting to be mature. For the first time, Zablanski has shown one way ice circles can form. But many of these beautiful natural phenomena remain mysterious, and not just on Earth. In uh, 2010, NASA discovered circular grooves hundreds of miles wide etched into the surface of Europa, Jupiter's icebound moon. And that, for now, will remain weird. What? Four unremarkable letters, A, T, G, and C. That's all there are in our DNA alphabet. Take those four letters, multiply them by billions, and arrange them in a unique sequence long enough to fill hundreds of telephone directories, and you have one strand of DNA, the source of the information that makes you, you, and me, me. But what if someone examined your DNA and revealed that you were not? who you thought you were, and in fact you were sharing your body with someone else. In 2002, Lydia Fairchild, mother to four children fathered by her partner Jamie Townsend, applied for state benefits to help raise her young family. In accordance with state law, Lydia and her children had DNA tests to prove parentage. At conception, we inherit half our DNA from our mother and half from our father. When all is normal, every child will have a genetic inheritance that can be easily traced to both parents. But Lydia's DNA results would prove to be far from normal. I got a call and the prosecutor had asked that I come up to the office. He started asking, like, was I trying to do fraud by getting help from the state? because these kids aren't yours and I, and I was just I stopped him for a minute I was like what do you mean these kids aren't mine and he says well the test came back Jamie is the father of all the kids but you are not the mother the tests were repeated twice more but both times the results were the same Jamie was the father none of the four children appeared to be related to Lydia I was so scared and they said that they were gonna take it to court because they didn't find that I was telling the truth. They thought that I was lying. The state prosecutor started an investigation and Lydia found herself in front of a judge. The judge looked at me and he says, uh, are these your children? I said, yes, they are. I, you know, I, carry, I got pregnant, I carried them, I delivered them. The doctor has ultrasounds of them being in my stomach. The judge said, you opened a big can of worms. He's like, I, we don't know what's going on here, but we're gonna figure it out. He said, and he wants me to go down to a special lab and had DNA tested on me and my children again. But now not through the nurse, through the prosecutor's office where she could possibly be making this mistake. Despite overwhelming evidence supporting Lydia's claim, four DNA tests show that she is not the biological mother of the children she gave birth to. But why? First and most obvious reason to be explored, the possibility that the DNA tests could be wrong. To be told that DNA is essentially foolproof is very problematic. Dr. Kerry Bowman specializes in the ethics of medicine. Many people in medicine, and I'm one of them, would say nothing in medicine is 100%. It can get close to it, but it's not 100%. The talk, though, with DNA is that there's an exception and that DNA is, is virtually foolproof as a testing strategy, when in fact, they may be rare, but there are exceptions to that. So in fact, did Lydia really have a fair consent process? I would say not. 
Parental DNA tests themselves are more than 99% accurate, but humans can and do make mistakes. Had this happened to Lydia's tests? My first thought is perhaps somehow the samples got screwed up. Maybe they mixed up her DNA sample with some other woman's and then when they tested it, of course it would show that it wasn't her kid. And my, my first goal was I was going to ask the court to order a whole new set of DNA tests done with a separate, a new laboratory to do it. See if a second laboratory came back with the same problem. Medical mix-ups do happen. In 2002, Linda McDougall from Woodville, Wisconsin, was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent a double mastectomy. However, two days after the operation, doctors told Linda it had all been a mistake. Her biopsy results had been accidentally switched with another patient's. Linda never had cancer, and so the surgery had been completely unnecessary. Did a similar human error skew Lydia's DNA results, or is the real answer to this mystery beyond anything medical science has ever imagined? So what is going on? Another theory suggests that Lydia could have given birth to her children and yet not have been their biological mother. It is speculated that Lydia was an IVF surrogate. So what a surrogate pregnancy is, is what used to be called test tube babies. When egg and sperm are introduced outside the womb in a lab condition, put together, they create an embryo, and that embryo is then put into the uterus of a surrogate mother. So this woman has no biological relationship to the child that she is carrying and will eventually bear. But why would Lydia have carried the fertilized eggs of another woman four times over? It certainly wouldn't benefit fraud. IVF itself is extremely expensive. And to speak in American dollars, you could easily be talking about thirty or fifty thousand dollars. And how someone like Lydia Fairchild would want or could possibly do this to create some kind of welfare scam, I can't even imagine how that would work. Uh, the costs simply don't line up to whatever benefits um, someone could, could pull from this in terms of a welfare scam. It doesn't make any sense. And as Dr. Chitayat explains, IVF is not something that can be done at home. It's impossible to do in your kitchen in vitro fertilization. You have to stimulate the ovary of the mother and you have to make sure that you don't overstimulate because then it will produce huge cysts in the ovary and can cause her to have dehydration and even death. So it has to be monitored very carefully by experts in this field. There's an even bigger problem with this theory. The father of all four of Lydia's children had been confirmed as her partner, Jamie Townsend. It wasn't logical that somebody would hire Lydia to carry surrogacy and then have them all fathered by Jamie Townsend. Why would they pick him? And besides that, the children didn't go off to live with the, the contracting people who had hired Lydia to be a surrogate. It was just illogical. I mean, it had to be, it could have been an explanation that she was a, that she was a surrogate parent, but I'd asked her, was there any surrogacy contract between you and anybody else? No. She was adamant she was not a surrogate parent for anybody. None of the theories seemed plausible, and the case seemed destined to remain as mysterious as it was bizarre, until Lydia's attorney discovered something almost too weird to be believed. A description in a medical journal of a rare and almost unheard of genetic condition only known to affect around 40 people in the whole world. Something called tetragametic chimerism. I was doing a little trolling on the internet and wondered if maybe it fit our scenario. And so I read it, as much of it as I could understand, but it sounded very much like what we were dealing with, so I contacted uh, Dr. Kruskal, who was one of the authors of the paper, she's now deceased, and uh, introduced myself on the phone and said, um, I think I've read your article, I think I have a case very much like it. Of course. They were intrigued about it, said, could I send you the test results we have, and maybe you can give us some insight of what's happening here. One way a chimera can form is when two separate eggs are fertilized by two sperm and then merge to form a single embryo. Put simply, it's two non-identical twins merging very early on in pregnancy. Their two sets of DNA are then intermingled throughout the body. If Lydia Fairchild was a chimera, it could explain how her biological children have different DNA. They would have inherited one set of DNA from one area of her body, 
while the laboratory sampled other areas that contained a completely different set of DNA. Well, everybody then, I think, is when they kind of stepped back a little bit more. The prosecutors were confused now. You know, all this time they've been trying to take them from me, and I can just see on their faces like, whoa. You know what I mean? What did we almost just do? The problem with chimerism is that you have to actually do biopsies from different body organs, liver, kidney, intestine perhaps, and find out if all of them contain the same genetic material as we check in the blood. Lydia was sent back for more DNA tests. This time, they took samples from all over her body. And my hair, blood, and swabs from my cheek came back as the same DNA, but my cervical smear came back as a different DNA, and it was actually the DNA that matched my children. The Chimera theory was confirmed, incredibly. Lydia Fairchild has two sets of DNA. The DNA in Lydia's ovaries being completely different from the DNA found in the rest of her body. Lydia Fairchild shows that DNA testing, fingerprintings, may not be perfect. So what happened in her was that the ovaries were produced by different cells than the cells that produced the white blood cells and the platelets in her blood. So those ovary produced her children as if they are produced by her sister, but her blood contained completely different DNA. And your ovaries are what hold your eggs. So when your egg comes down and then you get pregnant, your child is going to carry the, the DNA that's in your ovaries. And my ovaries is actually my twin's DNA. And that's when she, I was like, my twin, what are you talking about? I don't have a twin. And that's when she, they kind of broke it down about what happened. Amazingly, Lydia's children had inherited their DNA from the non-identical twin that Lydia's embryo fused with just after Lydia was conceived. There was a final court hearing and um, the judge, he granted me my children that I am the biological mom of my kids and I remember crying so bad that I finally won. After all that fighting I did, I believe it was two and a half years I fought for my kids to keep them in my life. Lydia's world had been changed forever. She is one of only about 40 people on the planet known to be a Camara. If I never did that DNA to determine if he was the father or not, I would never know today that I was Chimera. I mean, I would never know. I mean, I would still be living not ever knowing that I had two DNAs. Um, so it's very interesting how she broke it down for me about what had happened. Doctors believe there are many more as yet unidentified Chimeras out there. Could someone you know have an extra set of DNA they got from their own embryonic twin without them even knowing it? Weird or what? So there we have it. Three weird stories, each with several competing theories. A man undergoes a life-saving heart transplant procedure but gets more than he bargained for. A new organ and a new personality. Is this simply psychological or the side effects of medicinal drugs? Or can the heart or even individual human cells store a person's memories and characteristics? Around the world, perfect, beautiful spinning circles of ice forming in lakes and rivers. Are they the winter cousins of the infamous crop circle? Or does science have the answers? A mother is revealed to be genetically unrelated to her own children. Is she trying to commit fraud? Or is she the victim of a series of DNA mix-ups? Or are we dealing with a rare and extraordinary genetic oddity? Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be Weird or what?